So you can set up um, constraints. So for example, we could set up the coverage. You know, the coverage is uh, basically what lines of code were executed, what what uh, branches were taken, the, that type of information. Um, so here we would actually specify the function that we wanted to run coverage on inside the, the test code that's that's inside this test case. So for example, we have, a, yeah, here's a test case that has two functions that we're going to actually run coverage on. So the first is the, the whole function that's being tested and we expect 100% uh, object code. We could also put 100% source line code, I believe that should also pass the test. Um, I don't believe there's any conditions in this test, in this function that executes, so we don't have any information to input here. The other function that we have listed here is, is func stub. So this one's specifically here for, for testing purposes or example purposes to be stubbed out. And so we are gonna specify zero bytes of coverage for the, the function stub, because again, that's the one that's actually gonna be stubbed out and we're going to be providing a return value of 10 for that uh, nested call automatically without executing any code. Um, so we, sh we expect zero coverage for the execution of this stub. Um, let's go ahead and run this test case and see what we get. Okay, so in this case, probably the code was still running, so I'll go ahead and uh, cancel, and we'll just take a look at to see where we are. Okay, so we're stopped. Okay, so I stepped a few times. So let's go ahead and just... Uh, we'll go ahead and init the target from the test idea tool. That'll be a way to get control. So here we have an init target um, option. And so what I just did with the init target, that's actually something that we want to take a look at in the beginning. This is something that you want to set up uh, prior to running any tests. So the init, the initialization that I have set up is just to perform a download and run until main. So that ensures that the stack gets set up. That's really the only requirement for the test tool to, uh, to be able to run these tests on the target system without any um, instrumentation. So the other types of initializations that you could set up are, so if you have a multi-core system, you could connect to a certain core. Maybe you only want to run code on a specific core of your multi-core device. If maybe you need to set up a, a, a kind of a, a longer sequence of things where you're going to maybe download, run until a certain function, maybe then wait, wait until you're stopped because you have a breakpoint there, and then you're going to reset and uh, you know maybe call a certain function or a script function to do some special initialization. You you can do all this in this area, but you have to know that this is a you can set it up to always run this init sequence before the run. Um, but this is the default like initialize hardware sequence. There's another option for each individual test to have its own sort of initialization. Um, this is just a general initialization to get the stack set up. Okay, so let's remove that. Okay, we'll just cancel this. Okay, so what I just did, you know, I did the initialization, it performed a download, it ran until main. So now when we execute this test, it should have no problem. Okay, so the test is running, um, it executed, it, it passed, so we did get 0% um, object code for the function stub. The test uh, function, the function under test, did have 100%, which is what we expected. So that's good. There were 62 actual um, bytes of code in just six lines of code that were executed. Um, so that's basically how the coverage works. If you had a more you know, sophisticated uh, function that had maybe some branches and stuff, then you could set up some condition coverage here. And so the way the condition coverage is, if you expect a conditions, conditional statement to basically you don't care which way it was taken, um, then you can use this option here and just percentage of any, any, 
any percentage of certain uh, paths would satisfy uh, the condition any. For condition true only, this is if you expect you know a certain amount of your branches to be taken only true. That means they don't they don't actually get uh, evaluated as false. Then there's false only, and then there's both. So both is if you expect actually both pathways to be taken, not just one or the other. Um, both have to be taken in order for the both for the condition both to to pass. Okay, so. For coverage, so the way this is working for this, I do have the trace. It's recording a trace. We can actually even look in. Uh, so I did record a trace. We can actually look in the in WinIdea at the uh, trace file here. Let's see, trace file. It should be set up. Okay, let's run that one more time. So we've got our uh, iTrace tr uh, iTest Profiler TRD and our iTest Coverage uh, TRD file. So this is the timing information and this is the coverage information that we recorded. So basically it's just setting up uh, a coverage within WinIdea and then you know gathering that information and, and displaying it in test idea. So again, WinIdea is sort of the underlying um, tool that's being taken advantage of that's what that's what makes this test tool so so unique. It's basically there's a debugger in the background, um, doing all the the magic for you, you know, utilizing the trace, uh, creating the the call stack frames, um, you know, pushing things onto the stack for you, all of all of that stuff. Okay, but you do have access to the raw files here, so we could we could save this off for you know future audit or whatever. You'd have, and this information can be saved off and brought back into WinIdea uh, to be viewed in this in this format as well. Um, okay, so that's that's basically how the coverage works. So the other way, uh, so again, this was taken with um, the actual trace mechanism. The other way to set it up is using a feature called slow run. So if you don't have access to any trace interface. You can use a slow run feature. It, it does run the code very slow. So what it does is it single steps through the code and collects data similar to what a trace would collect between each step. So, and we can step at about, I don't know, 50, depending on the clocks and stuff, you can execute about 50 to 100 instructions per second. So, you know, these microcontrollers are used to running in the, in the megahertz uh, and you'd be running it like, you know, 100 hertz at the most or something. So if you do run in the slow run mode, it takes very, very long to execute, you know, just basic tests. So that's that's the huge trade-off. But sometimes you just don't have a capability to um, use a hardware trace. And you can just let this run overnight. So if, you know, using the slow run is, de is definitely a viable option. Okay, so that's for, for gathering coverage. Obviously, slow run won't work for gathering any type of timing information because you're single stepping. Um, that works fine for, for unit testing. Uh, you won't be able to get, get any real-time uh, profiler information from the slow run feature. Okay, so profiler. Profiler is where you do get the timing information. Um, here we have... So we, we can actually set up timing constraints for lots of different uh, measurements here. Net, net time, gross time, call time. So this is, uh, this is for multiple instances, nested calls, uh, call, you know, interrupts, if interrupts are being executed. In a unit test situation, you, won't, you wouldn't have interrupts, but you could still you know, measure net time or gross time if you had nested calls enabled. Um, but you're just given this information if, if you're curious how long it takes to execute your code, you know, in a, in a unit test situation. So you can do that if you have access to both program trace and data trace. You can record, uh, you know, the amount of time it took to execute code or the amount of time it took to, to change uh, variable values. 
So this is how, how frequent was this variable access. So it was actually only accessed four times. The minimum time was 364 nanoseconds. The max was 420 and the average was 397. So the other features that are available here are the raw trace data. So this is just a recording of program or data trace. If you wanna see kind of a record of what the code actually did during the test, you could use that. Again, this does require the, the trace or the slow run would actually work here since it's not recording any timing information. Only the profiler records the timing information. Hill is where we'd set up uh, any outputs for the analog digital I.O. module. So digital outputs or analog outputs for testing purposes, monitor any, any inputs as well um, of, of, the, of the system. If you're expecting, you know, maybe a test is expecting a certain input, you can also specify that here as well. We have scripts, so scripts can initialize or de-initialize the target system or just the, the script, the function that you're gonna be executing. So if you need any kind of special initialization, we had, a, for example, we had a customer that was running some kind of EEPROM failure tests and they were using this functionality to download kind of uh, EEPROM error error data and then running the test with that different error data loaded to the EEPROMs. So with the Python scripting, you can access all the functionality of the debugger. You know, the, the scripts allow you to basically access everything that you can do in the tool uh, manually. Options is where you, if you needed to change any options in WinIdea, you could do that. The dry run feature, Basically, it's called a dry run where you're just executing all the tests, but you're not um, checking any of the results. You're just collecting all the results sort of as a starting point to, to help you write, write your tests. Um, and then finally, there's diagrams where we can generate call graphs or other types of, uh, other types of charts. So some of these do require... Uh, timing information, so like the sequence diagram does require uh, the profiler to, to be uh, saved, the profiler information to be saved, so you do have, have to have access to the trace at that point. Um, same with the call graph, I believe. So we'll, we'll see if we can generate one of these. Um, so here we have the call graph that we generated, we can see um, after when idea runs the unit test, then the data collected is then presented in the call graph. Uh, 